here from Chicago area to be a part of the church, the launch team, and she has served so faithfully, uh, not just in the worship team, a lot of people don't understand this too, but she she came here to be a partner to help and to serve, and so we had a need with ushers and greeters and VIPs, we need somebody to lead that team, she jumped in, she said, I'll do it. We needed a need with finances, she said, I'll do it, and things that, that, that a lot of people don't necessarily want to do, but her heart was for the church, and she said, there's a need, and I'm going to fill it, and and. That's the kind of heart that God desires. And Ryan, we just want to take a second and say thank you. Just say thanks to Ryan. And we know that we know that Phoenix, wherever she plugs into, is going to be different because of her heart for Jesus and for His kingdom. And so, thank you so much for pouring into this church uh, through worship, through all of those areas, uh, and with youth. Um, she's led youth worship since it started, and uh, and we love you, and we're excited to see what you're going to do in Phoenix. Um, yeah, so let's, we're going to continue now to, uh, to move on with our, our time of singing with worship. And I just want to encourage you guys, let's open our hearts to him. Let's open our hearts as we sing. Uh, and let's really engage our creator here. Down my crown. 
walking in the full understanding of just what that means, just how much he really loves us. Because I don't know about you, but I've been in, in stages in my life when it feels like I can just never get it right. It feels like every day I let myself down, I let my family down, I let God down. And it's really easy, and, and I think the enemy wants us to carry that with us. But the Bible says that his mercies are new every morning. That means every single day. That doesn't just mean on Sundays where we come here and we feel really good. That means every morning. So it means that we don't come here on Sundays and we feel great and we feel connected to God. And then tomorrow when we mess up, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday are bad. Because Tuesday morning, his mercies are still new. And I think there's a lot of people in this room that you need to start walking in victory every day. You don't need to go like this throughout the week. The highs on Sundays, the lows throughout the week. 
because his mercies are new every day. His sacrifice is new, it's fresh every single morning. All you have to do is accept it. All you have to do is understand it. And so when we sing this song, we're declaring his great love. We're not declaring his great love on Sunday. We're declaring his great love every day. 24-7, 365, his love is real and it's fresh and it's new. And so I wanna sing this again, yeah. Praise God, thank you Jesus. So I'm gonna sing this again as a church and let's declare with this understanding of that his mercies are new, that, that we don't have to carry sin, we don't have to carry shame, we can call on him. So let's sing this together, let's lift our voice, we'll declare one more time as a church that he loves us. Come on. Yeah, he My name's Connor. I am the youth pastor here at Church of the Four Corners, and uh, we're so glad that you're here with us this morning. And we're just, uh, we woke up this morning, we were we were dreaming of, of praising God and just entering into worship, but we were thinking about you as well. So we hope you've had an amazing experience so far. We know that God has a word just for you this morning, and, and uh, we just pray that you receive that. Um, if you're here for the first time, we want to just embarrass you a little bit. I'm going to have all of you come up front. I'm just kidding. We just want to uh, just say, you know, thanks for being here. You could be anywhere, but you chose to come this Sunday morning and be with us. And we just want to honor you. Church, can we give it up for all of our first-time guests? Yeah. So glad that you're here. We want to know you were here. We don't just want to applaud you. We would love to know that you were here. When you walked in, you received this card. It's called your Connect card. There's a place on here for your information, and there's a box that's highlighted in blue. You could fill your information out so we know who you are, and then check the box highlighted in blue if you're here for the first time. That's how we will know, so don't forget to check that box. And then you can do one of two things to get it to us. You can drop it off at the end of service. There'll be buckets going around. You can just drop it in there, and we'll receive it. Or what we recommend is that you hold on to it after service is all done, and you're leaving. You walk out these back doors, take a right like you're going to leave. There's a table in the hallway. It's our VIP table. And what they will do is they'll take this card, and in exchange, they will give you a gift. We got a coffee mug and a, a few other little goodies we want to give you just to bless you because you are our guests of honor. So make sure, take advantage of that, take this to the VIP table, okay? Fill it out for us. We want to know you were here. And I want to give you our no-hassle guarantee. If you fill this out, we will not come to your house later with cookies or balloons. We will simply send you an email that says thanks for coming. We want to respect your privacy, but we care that you were here. So make sure, fill that out. We also want you to know that there's an alternate viewing environment. It's located in our cafe, which is right through this wall. Hopefully you've been there because we give away amazing espresso coffee. Um, but if you, if you haven't, make sure you grab some of that next week. But in there right now, there is a TV that is streaming everything that's going on in here. If you need to step out this morning and take a phone call or if there's something you need to take care of, 
don't go outside or down a hallway. Go into our cafe. We don't want you to miss what God has for you this morning just because something came up. Make sure and take advantage of that because we made that for you guys in mind. So uh, we're so excited. Today we're starting a new series called Nehemiah. It's going to be awesome. Um, I've got a couple announcements before we get to it. And the first one is that today we're doing Growth Track Step 1. And growth Track is a set of cyclical classes we do after second service, immediately following it. There's a classroom back here that we go into. Food and child care is provided. It's a way for you to get to know our church better. It's a way for you to get to know yourself better, your spiritual giftings. It's a way for you to get plugged into ministry. If any of that stuff sounds interesting to you, Craig's going to talk about it more at the end of service. Make sure and listen up for that. And the other thing I want to share this morning before we get started is we have a story that came in. We ask people that are part of our church to email us at info at cotfc.com if they want to share their testimony or an experience they had or whatever. We want to hear it. And so this is one of those that someone sent in last week about our series at the movies. And I think it will really encourage you about what God's doing in independence. Let me read it to you. They emailed and they said, I was fortunate to attend the last two sessions of the At The Movies series. On a technical level, it was very well done. I really enjoyed how it flowed and how it looked, but on a spiritual level, I was blown away by the messages in both About Time and The Impossible that you related to. I really connected on a deep emotional level with the sermon on The Impossible. I've been disconnected from God for several years now. Never really felt confident on where I stood with my religion, where I stood with my relationship with God and my spirituality. I haven't actively been in church in at least seven years. While I'm far from knowing all the answers to my questions in life and with my spirituality, today I opened up my heart to him for the first time in several years. I raised my hand and accepted him into my life in today's August 7th sermon. Can we give it up for God? I mean, praise God. God's moving in independence and... Sundays matter. What we're doing here matters. And so the people that help on the crew, what you do matters. We're so thankful for you, and we're so thankful for what God is doing here. And we're so excited to start this new series. We know that God has something for everybody in this room. And so before we get there, I want you to stand up this morning, greet somebody, tell somebody something about you that they don't know, and we'll get started. Hey guys, what's up? It's Matt and I'm the media pastor here at the church. I just want to say welcome. I am so excited that you guys are here at church with us today. Just want to let you know about our 21 days of prayer that's coming up on August 21st. I want to challenge you guys to be thinking about what you could give up in order to get closer to God. And we're going to do this together as a church. And so it's going to be an amazing thing to be a part of. Also, starting on Saturday, August 27th, we're going to be having prayer meetings here at Truman High School. We're going to be meeting inside the lecture hall at 8 a.m. We want to encourage everyone that can to come out and be a part of this. It's going to be such an amazing time when we seek God in prayer together. It's crazy to think that in less than a month, we're going to be three years old as a church. It feels like it's gone so fast. We're so excited for that. Now, next Sunday, we're going to have a video booth set up, and we just simply want you guys to say what you love about the church, if the church has helped you, anything that has impacted you from the church over the last three years. We really want to know those stories so that we can share those and celebrate all that God has done. So parents, as you go to pick up your kids today, don't forget to bring your parent sticker tag with you before you go into the kids area. This is just to make sure that our kids are as safe as they possibly can be. If you don't have that tag when you come out of service, just simply go back to kids check-in and you can have a new one printed. We're so excited to have you guys at church today. Now let's get ready to start our brand new series, Nehemiah. Let's give it up for Matt's face. 
Beautiful. Hey, we're so excited that you're with us today. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Craig Cackley. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm so honored to be with you and to just share the Word of God. I'm going to have to dust off the shelves a little bit and oil the hinges. I actually haven't had the chance to preach to you in person in over six weeks because we've been teaching you via video through our At The Movies series. And have you guys enjoyed that series? Wasn't that fun? Matt and the media team did such a phenomenal job. And, man, we had just heard from so many different people that, Craig, I had no idea what to expect during At The Movies, but it was far greater and it exceeded all of my expectations. And in fact, the feedback was so overwhelmingly positive, we have decided to make At The Movies a recurring annual series here at our church. So we'll do it again. It will be back. Uh, this is hard to believe, but how many of you, like last week or this week, you get to send your kids back to school by a show of hands? Where are you at? Like literally? Okay. How many of you are excited to send your kids back to school. That's right. Hey, there's no judgments here. This is church. It's a safe place. Like, oh, Craig, you must not love your kids. You don't want to send them back to school. No, it's because I love my kids, they've got to go back to school. And you parents know what I'm talking about, because I don't want to murder them. And that's a very beautiful process that takes place. But I love this time of the year. Football is back. Come on, she's fans. Where you at? <laughs> September 11th. Cannot get here soon enough. We get back into a routine finally, and even in the life of our church, there are so many exciting things taking place. Specifically today, we're beginning a brand new series, Teaching Through the Book of Nehemiah. Now, a couple times a year, we will take a break as a church from the more topically driven type messages, whether that would be a series on prayer or a series on relationships or finances, and we'll just teach through a book of the Bible. In the past, we've taught through the books of Philippians, Galatians, James, Esther, just to name a few. And I'm incredibly excited to journey with you for the next three weeks as we teach through this phenomenal book of Nehemiah. In fact, Nehemiah is one of my favorite books of the Bible for many different reasons. One of the reasons is that Nehemiah takes place at a very interesting point in the history of the Israelites. Now, I don't know all of your story. Maybe for some of you, you are newer to church. Maybe you're newer to your understanding of the Bible. And let me just be the first one to say, not only is that okay, uh, we celebrate that. We think that's a great thing. And we actually started this church for people like you. And so the Israelites, they are in the Old Testament of your Bible, which is really the first half. It, it almost like chronicles their entire journey as a people. And despite God's incredible favor on the Israelites and his just numerous supernatural interventions, whether that would be uh, him rescuing them out of slavery in Egypt, we'll talk more about that later, God parting the Red Sea, feeding his people miraculously by providing manna from heaven, water from the rock, just incredible military victories, and on and on and on. So despite all of those times where God blessed and favored the Israelites, they have found themselves in a season where they have once again turned their backs on God. And they've disobeyed God by, um, by intermarrying it with other pagan nations, by worshiping false gods. And so God does what he promised he would do if the Israelites fall away from him, and it's that he lifts his hands of protection off the people. And see, one thing you need to understand is that the Israelites, for the large portion of their history, have never been the most powerful nation, but yet they were always the nation that had God's favor. They were always the nation that God moved on their behalf. And so the Israelites, much like us, outside of God's help, they find themselves helpless. So what ends up happening is that several different nations invade and attack and conquer the Israelites. And it really all culminates when the Babylonians, and mind you, these aren't just like aloof Bible stories. These are very real historical events that took place. The Babylonians come in and they conquer the northern parts of Israel and then eventually the southern parts of Judah. 
and they exile many, because this was a part of the, the Babylonian strategy, is they would exile many of the fighting men and the artisans and the craftsmen and literally strip that place of their cultural identity. They wanted them to not only be left in ruins physically with their structure, they wanted to rob them of any sense of pride that they once had. So it would be like the equivalent of someone coming in just to help us wrap our minds around this Kansas City and conquering our city. And then they would like steal away all of our Royals players and steal away the Chiefs and they would take our barbecue. See, now the guys are listening, ladies. That was my tactic there. They would steal away Joe's Kansas City. They would take away Arthur Bryant's and my personal favorite, Q39. Come on, where are you at? They would steal our barbecue. They would tear to the ground uh, 18th and Vine and ship away all of our jazz and blues musicians. They would burn our coffee shops down. The humanity. Right? And if those things were to occur, it would, like, it would tear our city apart. It would strip us of this pride and what makes our city special and unique. And that's exactly what the Babylonians did to the Israelites. It was a very dark and very hopeless season. And so in our story, we fast forward several hundred years, and we find our exiled Israelite main character, Nehemiah. And he's actually landed a pretty sweet gig as the cupbearer of the Persian king Artaxerxes. Say that with me, Artaxerxes. Now, before you go on feeling bad for Nehemiah, his life's pretty sweet, all right? And despite maybe what you've heard, uh, a cupbearer wasn't this lowly servant. Rather, a cupbearer would have been a, a coveted position. Now, life could definitely, um, it could have been better, but it could have definitely been worse. You know, a cupbearer would have been like the modern day equivalent. We don't have cupbearers anymore, mostly because there's much more efficient ways to kill your enemies than poisoning their wine. But it would have been like the modern day equivalent of a secret service agent, someone that the president or the king would have entrusted with his life. Right? So life could definitely be worse for Nehemiah. He's working for the king, ergo, he's living in the palace. He's seated in the lap of luxury. He's enjoying the benefits of an opulent life. I'm sure he's very well connected socially, gets to eat and drink whatever he wants. Yeah, sure, he's a foreigner living in a foreign land, but he's living a very comfortable life. That is until he has a defining moment where he discovers his purpose and his life is forever changed. Which then leads me to the second reason why I love the book of Nehemiah. Because it's safe to say that for a large portion of those of you here this morning, you've struggled with this thought or insecurity. That God will never use me to accomplish anything extraordinary in my life because I'm not like the, the guys and the gals that I read about in the Bible. Right? I'm not like them. Those guys and those gals, they were, they were judges and kings, apostles, priests. And you're thinking, I'm just a normal person. Can I let you in on a little secret? So was Nehemiah. He was just a normal guy. He wasn't a pastor. He was just a normal lay guy that was successful in his life, and he decided to go all in for God. It's truly extraordinary. And so really, our story picks up when Nehemiah, he's doing his thing in the palace. He's attending to the king. And a couple of his buddies from his hometown show up. And Nehemiah asks them a very dangerous question. He says, how are things going back home? And that's where I want to pick up reading with you this morning in Nehemiah chapter 1, starting in verse 3, when we read their response. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. Meaning that as it stands right now, 
the Israelites are susceptible to all the attacks of the enemies. They're very vulnerable. And now, mind you, Nehemiah would have already known this, all right? This, this conquer, that, that this took place hundreds of years ago. However, what he wouldn't have known is that every single effort to rebuild the wall would have been torn down. Every effort to restore dignity and honor and safety back to the promised land of God would have been shut down completely. And this right here, this small snapshot in the, the grand scope of human history, Nehemiah's life is going to change. Right here. Nehemiah is about to experience a God moment that will, in the best way possible, irrevocably wreck his life. Because I love Nehemiah's response to his friends. He doesn't kind of like do the church thing that we become accustomed to, if we're, it's okay to be honest, where we, we like act like we care, but we don't really. Like, oh, bro. Mm, mm, bro. So sorry. Oh, I'm just so sorry to hear that. Um, do you want to grab lunch? We've got some grapes, some baguettes at the palace. No, you good? Okay. Like he, he, doesn't, he doesn't say, oh, man, that's terrible. I can't believe that happened. I really hope that someone does something, but you know, my sundial, I got this thing, I gotta peace out. Like, he, he doesn't do any of that. But rather, this is his response, and I just pray that this speaks to you this morning. He says this in verse four. He says, when I heard these things, I sat down and I wept. And this isn't some momentary, emotional reaction he says, for some days, I mourned and I fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Can I ask you a question this morning? When was the last time in your life that God moved you in this way? When was the last time that God moved you to the point of tears? Where possibly there was some injustice or cause that was brought before you and literally your only response there was it, it just rocked your world there was this 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 up spring of emotion it, it just shook you to the point this holy indignation rose up within you that literally your only response was that as god is my witness i will not stand or sit idly by but i will do something anything about this when is the last time you've had a nehemiah moment Because when that happens, you may have just discovered your purpose. When this happens, this may be God's way of giving you the green light and saying, it's now time for you to get off the bleachers and get into the game. I had a moment like this six years ago. Now, I can honestly say that for me in my life, I felt the call of church planning for close to a decade. But I can tell you the exact moment that I knew I would plant a church in Kansas City. For those of you who don't know uh, my family's story, back in 2010, we really sensed that God was leading us to move from Independence to this small farm town, about an hour and a half outside of Chicago called Sandwich, Illinois. Yes, it's okay to laugh. That's a real place. It was around the population 6,000. It was a very small place. And I'll never forget the very first time I preached at the church, this girl approached me and she said, Craig, you won't believe this, but we went to high school together. What? That was insane. Like, what are the chances? I went to a huge high school, but I had never seen this girl before. I had never heard of her name. So a few months later, she comes to me and she says, Craig, I've been praying for my sister who lived back in our hometown. So she just, she's kind of given up on God. She's given up on the idea of church. She's strayed. And I've been pleading with her, begging her, just give God one more chance. Just give church one more chance. And she said, Craig, I need you to help me. Give me a recommendation. It's got to be good. She's going to give God one more shot. And I, I just kind of sat there 
and I froze. And I said, uh, you know, I'll do some research. Let me make some calls. Let me, let me surf some websites. I'll do whatever I can to help you out. But I had nothing. And guys, it was in that moment that I had my Nehemiah moment. It was in that instance that I knew I need to do something about this injustice. That God was calling me to plant a church for people like her sister. For the wanderers, for the wounded, for those who had given up on the idea of church. Now, please don't mishear my heart. I'm not trying to say for a moment that we think that we're the only good church in this town. Because since moving back, I have had the incredible privilege of meeting numerous pastors. And I could make amazing recommendations. But the point is this. That I saw an injustice I saw a girl who needed God, who needed a community where she could connect, and I didn't know where one existed. So instead of being like the marginalized and just like, well, I'm going to sit over here and complain about everything and just criticize the church, I knew that I needed to criticize by creating. I knew that God had then called me to give my life to planting churches for those who have given up on the idea of church. It was my Nehemiah moment. And see, that is exactly what happens to Nehemiah. He's so deeply moved by the turmoil and the the disgrace that his hometown is in. He knows that I have got to do something about this. And Nehemiah, he was also wise enough and intuitive enough to understand that he couldn't be a catalyst for change from the comfort of the palace. He knew that if he was going to make a significant difference, that he was going to have to step outside of his comfort, and God was calling him from the palace to his purpose. But in order to do so, he had to take a huge risk. He had to approach his boss, King Artaxerxes, one of the most powerful men in the world, and he needed to make a very big ask. And let's read together what happens in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 4. It says, the king said to me, what is it that you want? And then I prayed to, to the God of heaven. I think this was kind of one of those, oh shoot, uh, moments. Like maybe the, the prayers that you mutter under your breath, like maybe before you get married or you buy your first house. Or like these major decisions where you're like laying it all on the line. Like, oh Jesus, you're going to have to help me. And he rolls into it. it. says, and I answered the king, if it pleases the king... And if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. He's like, let me bring some hope back to my hometown. Miraculously, what happens next is that King Artaxerxes grants Nehemiah his request. And not only that, the king decides to leverage his influence to fund the project. Let me say that again in case you missed it. Pagan king decides to lend out his most trusted servant to leave. And by the way, you don't have a lot of those guys when you're on the top. You don't have a lot of guys that you can trust with your life. He sends him out and he says, oh, not only that, I'm going to bankroll the entire process of you restoring dignity, honor, and safety back to the promised land of God. Huh. How many of you know that God is up to something in Nehemiah's life? This is not normal behavior. It's truly remarkable. Thus begins the journey that we're going to go on for the next three weeks at this church. So Nehemiah, he steps out of the comfort of the palace He goes back to Jerusalem, and like any of us in our lives, the moment that you step out to pursue your purpose, there's going to be opposition, expect it. Actually, the opposition will be the confirmation. There's going to be distractions. There will be people in your life who will try to deter you to settle for the good things, to keep you from the great things. There's going to be criticisms And Nehemiah, he experiences all of those. But yet, throughout this entire story, throughout this entire book, 
there is just this one common beautiful denominator that flows through it, and it's of God's faithfulness in Nehemiah's life. See, one thing you need to understand at our church, because if you don't, nothing we do will ever make sense to you, is that we are bought into the idea that God has four purposes that he wants to see accomplished in our lives. And we talk about this a lot. In fact, here in a few months, we're going to be doing a series entitled, I Was Made For This, dedicated around this idea, and I believe it's going to be an absolute game changer for our church. But these, these four purposes are actually derived from the book of Exodus in cha chapter 6, verse 6. When God is speaking to a man named Moses, and he's giving him a message to once again give to the Israelites. So this is before they've been exiled. This is all the way back when they're slaves in Egypt. So God says to Moses, say to these slaves, who by the way had been enslaved for over 400 years. So the people that Moses is speaking to, their great, 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 great grandparents were also slaves. So once again, they have no identity. And God says this, he says, therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. We believe that the first purpose that God has for our lives is that he wants to give us a new heritage. He wants to put us under a new authority, and that happens with a relationship with him through his son, Jesus. We call this knowing God. And he goes on to say that I will free you from being slaves to them. It's this idea that not only do I want to physically give you a new heritage and put you under a new authority and physically remove you from Egypt, but I now want to remove the slavery mentality from you. You tracking with me? The, the idea that there's a difference where we can say a prayer and we can put our hope in Jesus and experience spiritual transformation, but we still got some hangups. We might still have some issues and addictions that we're working through, and God wants to set us free from those things. He wants us to find freedom in our lives. He goes on to say, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. The idea that we're created with a redemptive purpose. Think about it. For those of us in Christ, we're uniquely gifted. We're not gifted the same. The Bible de describes it as we're one body, but we're different parts. Some of us are fingers and feet and a mouth. I like to joke that I'm clearly the face. Not funny. We're all different parts. We all have different functions. Even for those of you who are like, I'm not a Christian. God has still gifted you with natural aptitudes and abilities. And is it all this grand cosmic coincidence? Or was it done with intentionality and purpose? We believe that. We believe if God has gifted you uniquely, then according to Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's workmanship or his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus. Why? to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. So we were actually born with a purpose, and that's what we're honing in on throughout this series. It's like, for some of you, for all of you, God created you with a purpose, and we want to help discover what that Nehemiah moment is. And then it goes on to say in verse 7, and I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God, and then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And notice how the first three promises, they're personal and they're individual, but this promise is corporate. It involves other people. I always get asked the question, well, Craig, do I need to go to church to be a Christian? No. No? But you sure can't live out this promise of God without a body and other people. In fact, I would challenge you to search the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation and give me a single example of a person who made a significant difference for God by themselves. You won't find it. Even Jesus, he uses people. It's this idea that we need each other to make a difference. We're created to make a difference. And we actually buy into this so much that 
we believe that your life will never make sense to you. For some of you, you're just overcome with this ambiguity of purpose and vision and direction. You're like, ah, why am I here? We believe your life, it will never make sense until you know God through a personal relationship with his son, Jesus. So you can find freedom from those hangups and those addictions and that the oppression in your life. And so you can discover your purpose by understanding how God wired you uniquely so that you can use those gifts and abilities to make a difference in the life of another person. We believe that's God's process for us. So now that we've laid a foundation for our story of Nehemiah, which we'll be building on for the next couple weeks, let me make this personal once again and ask you the question I did before. When is the last time that God has shaken your heart and he's moved you, he's deeply impacted you, and he has burdened you to where maybe you still feel the weight of it today? When's the last time that you've had that Nehemiah moment? And maybe an even better question is, what did you do with that? For some of you, did you retreat back to the comfort of the palace? Did you decide that it would be best to not disrupt the normal rhythm of my life? Or did you pursue your purpose? And I'll show, the, I'll show my hand, that's kind of our goal for the next couple weeks. I am going to give it my all to convince you and motivate you. I will even plead and beg you to pursue your purpose because you were born with a purpose. You were born with a greater mission, something that you are intended to engage in that's bigger than yourself. Well, Craig, how could you be so pompous and arrogant to know that? That's easy. Because Jesus models it for us. Because if you haven't caught on already, the story of Nehemiah is the story of Jesus. Did you catch it? The story of Nehemiah is, is the story of Jesus. It was Jesus who moved from the palace to pursue his purpose. It was Jesus who voluntarily gave up his glory so he could take on our poverty. You don't believe me? Look what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, for your sake and mine, he became poor so that you through his poverty might become rich, that God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. So what does it look like for you to maybe for the next few weeks, open up your heart to set fear aside, to set convenience aside, and to pursue the purpose that God has for you. God is building something beyond us. Man, what a minuscule and pathetic life that we would live if we only lived for ourselves. But God's going to build something. He longs for something in us and through us that's bigger than we could ever imagine. But it starts when we're open to discovering our purpose, stepping out of the palace and pursuing it. Amen? Pray with me this morning. God, I thank you that we don't believe that this is all a result of some cosmic coincidence. Lord, we thank you that, God, out of all of your creation, I believe that humankind was your greatest. That after the creation story, you stood back and you said that it is good. I thank you that you're a God who doesn't make junk. You're a God who doesn't make mistakes. But God, you are a God who created us with this, this intentionality and purpose beyond what the limitations of our finite minds can even begin to understand. Father, I pray right now for those in the room who feel worthless, 
for those in the room who feel like they've just made so many mistakes that they have somehow disqualified themselves from this purpose that God it's still available to them that God you you stand outside of time and space and you knew how it was going to go down and father you're not giving up on them your word reminds us in Romans that while we were still sinners Jesus died for us so we don't have to try to earn our acceptance and love you offer it unconditionally so father we pray against condemnation and guilt but we pray for those in this place that they would God the shroud would be removed and you could very clearly speak to them because you are a God who says I will be found by you that when we seek you we find you and we seek you with all of our hearts Father, I pray that purposes would be discovered throughout this series in Jesus' name. So with every head bowed, let's just create a space here for a moment. And maybe you're here and, and you would say this, Craig, I I'm in. I want to know why God placed me here. Because we believe there's two important days in our life. The day you're born and then the day you realize why you were born. I want to know got these gifts, I've got these abilities, what, what's God want to do with me? And if you're here and just very honestly, you'd say, I need God to help me uncover my purpose. If that's you, would you raise your hand? I want to pray over you this morning. Yeah, hands up all over. You're not alone. You're not alone. Thank you. Thank you. you can put those hands down. Secondly, the second group of people here are those of us who maybe God has revealed some of these things to us. Maybe we've had these Nehemiah moments. We've sensed the injustice. We've, knowing our gifting and our abilities, we recognize the need. We've seen our place, our purpose, but yet for whatever reason, maybe it was fear, maybe it was insecurity, we just chose the comfort of the palace. And maybe you're here and, and you would say, that's me, Craig. In the past, I, I've retreated. I've chosen the palace over my purpose, but today, I want to commit before God that I want to take some next steps to begin to pursue God's purpose for my life. If that's you, would you raise your hand? We want to pray over you. Yep, 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 yep. That's awesome. Thank you, thank you. you put those hands down. Lastly, maybe you're here and you would say this, Craig, my heart in this moment, it's softened, it's sensitive. And we believe that you'll never truly know your purpose apart from a, a relationship with God through his son, Jesus. That is the first step. And maybe for you in this moment, you're realizing I need to do that. I need to, to humble myself and I need to call upon the name of Jesus. And it's so much more than saying a prayer, folks, but it starts there. And I promise I'm not gonna embarrass you. We're not gonna call you forward. We're not that kind of church. Maybe you're here and you say, I need to meet Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. If that's you, I would love to pray over you. I've actually been praying over you all week. Would you just raise your hand real quick? Would you raise your hand? Thank you. I see the hand. Anyone, I see the hand. Anyone else say, I just need Jesus today. Thank you. Thank you. We're so proud of you. You can put those hands down. Father God, we just, we pray over every person in this room who responded. God, for those who, they need to discover their purpose I pray that you would give them the courage and the boldness to take the next steps that, that they need to do so. And we're going to give them some very practical next steps. God, secondly, I pray for those who, they, knew, they know the purpose. They've discerned why you placed them on this planet. But because of, for whatever reason, they've been sidetracked and distracted and been put on the sidelines. I pray that you can help them get in the game. I pray that you just help them realize that today is the day that the Lord has made. Help them be filled with courage. We know that you don't give us a spirit of fear. Help them pursue your purpose in the midst of opposition and distractions and criticisms because we believe that you're going to orchestrate something amazing through them. And lastly, for those who raise their hand to say, I need to meet Jesus this morning as my Lord and Savior, I pray that right now in this moment, God, they can, in their own words, begin to invite you into their hearts. They can begin to acknowledge that, Jesus, you are the Son of God. That you came to this earth and you lived a perfect and sinless life. But you were nailed to the cross. 
voluntarily. You chose to be nailed to that cross and shed your blood so that you could pay the penalty for our sin. And even though they put you in the grave, God, three days later, you rose again. You defeated death. Father, I pray that even right now they would just ask for the forgiveness of their sins. They would invite the, the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit to consume them as they begin to pursue you every day. God, help us as we journey as a church for the next few weeks. Help us take next steps towards you, layer by layer. Would you mold us into the perfect image of your son? And as always, we'll continue to give you all of the glory and all of the praise. And everyone said, amen, amen. Hey, can we thank God for those who responded this morning? We're so proud of you. Hey, here in a moment, at this church, we don't count it as a burden, but rather as a freedom and a, as a privilege to give to God through the giving of our tithes and our offerings, and it's an act of worship. So here in a moment, we're going to do just that. And if you're new here, don't feel any obligation to give. This is for those who would say that Jesus is Lord in my life. And we're going to have some options on the screen. But before we do, I want to give you some next steps on where we can go from our message today. If you raised your hand and you said, Craig, I... I I invited Jesus into my life and I surrendered my, my life to him. Would you do me a huge favor? Would you indicate that by checking the box on the connect card? And here's why that's so important is what we're going to do is we're not going to call you. We're not going to show up to your house. That would be weird for all of us. All right. But we're going to send you an email and it's actually going to be a series of emails over about a month with about a paragraph of content that will be so incredibly helpful for you as you enter into this next season. Chunks and bite-sized pieces of information that will encourage you as you begin this new walk in Christ. Secondly, for those of you who said, Craig, there were so many of us who raised our hand. I wanna discover my purpose. Well, you are in luck, and this is not a coincidence. We planned it this way, but starting today, as Connor mentioned, we have our step one of our growth track. Now, this will be the we won't offer step one again for several more months. And it's gonna be happening immediately following service as you exit the theater to your left in our growth track room. We have a series of four classes that is intentionally and strategically designed to walk you through this process to help you understand why you were placed on this earth. And I just wanna challenge you to just take part and to be in that class. If you've got those questions, be in the class. Oh, it's a four-week commitment. Yes, be inconvenienced, sarcasm intentional for four weeks. We'll watch your kids and we'll feed you. I believe that this class has the potential to change some of your lives. Please show up and I promise that you will not regret it. So here in a moment, we're going to have the opportunity to worship God, as I mentioned, through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. And for those of you who were here last week, uh, we prayed over a good friend of mine whose name is Craig Kopenbarger, who planted Valor Church last Sunday in Nob Noster, and they had an incredible launch Sunday. I think we got a picture of that that we're going to put up on the screens, hopefully here in a moment. But I texted Craig this week, and I just said, Craig, how was the launch? And he said, it went incredible. God showed up and did extraordinary things. So can we just thank God for what he's doing in Nob Noster at through Whiteman Air Force Base? so proud of him and this month we've made valor church our partner so a percentage of all of uh, what we receive as a church will go to financially bless them and i'm going to try to get craig to come in, in the next few weeks and just kind of cast some of the vision of what god is up to in not nostra amen well hey stand with me as we prepare our hearts one more time to worship god we thank you that you are doing something in Kansas City and Independence and Nob Nasser throughout Whiteman Air Force Base. God, we know that you are a God who pursues us. So Father, in this moment, we hold all that you've given us with an open hand, and we say that you are Jehovah Jireh. You are our provider. Father, it's in you we put our trust and our hope, not in our government or our nation or in our jobs. It's in you. So we lift up all that we have and we pray that you would be honored and glorified through it. And in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Let's worship together. Yeah, he loves us.
thank you for joining us this week. We pray you guys have a blessed week. There's prayer up here in front. We encourage you to take advantage of that. And we'll see you next week for week two of Nehemiah.